Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, Concord Bookshop. Uh, we're very happy to see so many people here to uh, uh, hear Tracy read from her book. Uh, this is a wonderful book. Uh, I have read it. When I first started, I knew nothing about it. Uh, but I went from start to finish uh, without hesitation. And it really is a very, very good book. Very good. Uh, Tracy Wynn earned her MFA from the uh, Warren Wilson College Program for Writers and is the recipient of grants from the Mass Cultural Council, the Barbara Deming Memorial Trust, and the Arch and Bruce Brown Foundation. Her stories have appeared in uh, New Orleans Review, Alaska Quarterly Review, uh, Hayden's Ferry Review, and Western Humanities Review. Uh, she works with Gaining Ground, a local nonprofit farm that gives produce and local sh uh, shelters, uh, pro that gives produce to local shelters and meal programs. Uh, uh, this series of interconnected stories uh, form a powerfully powerful uh, reminder of the dignity of the common man and woman and the fact that all of us are a somebody, all of us. So uh, without further ado, all right, let's start. Uh, thank you, Matt, and also to John and Jill, if you're here, and the whole staff, thank you, thanks for the opportunity um, to come and share my book this afternoon. I hope that people can hear me. I have a really little voice. Can you hear, can you hear Lynn? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the book, just a little bit, and then uh, I'm going to read you from the first story, um, then talk for just a little bit more, and then read you from the last story. Um, these stories are interconnected in, um, I hope, intriguing and unusual ways. Um, one of them, if people have asked, why not a why do people write interconnected stories? Why not a novel? Um, well, first, I, I love short stories, and I like to read them, and I like to write them. But beyond that, um, I'm really interested in how we get to know people. And the way that I develop my characters, I think, it follows a lot the way we learn about friends. Um, so that. Um, in one story, you'll hear about one character, or you'll be in the head of one character. And in another story in the book, you'll see that character from outside. Um, and then in a third story, you'll check in with that same character again at another point in their lives. So that what I hope happens is that there's a, a layering, a kind of development of knowledge of these people um, that you, I, I'm not sure that that novels do that so much. Um, and I also don't know if I could write a novel, so. <laughs> um, the stories take place from 1947, um, right up until the present. Um, they're set in the city of Lowell. Um, and um, my concerns are, um, I think often with the powerless, and sometimes um, sometimes that's children, uh, sometimes it's um, the workers in the mills. Um, but I, one of the things that I always try to do is to speak a little bit for those who don't have as much power as others. Um, so there's a little bit of a, an agenda underneath there. Um, let's see. I guess what I'd like to do now is read to you from Mrs. Somebody Somebody, the title story. Um, this is the section, section called Hub Hosiery Mill. It's set in 1947. Lucy Matson was nobody, like all the women I worked with, until the day the baby fell out the window. It was break time at the mill. Us girls from knitting leaned on the railing over the North Canal airing out our armpits and sharing smokes. The baby was bare except for diapers. It fell like a bomb in the newsreels. 
Where we were, the mill wall ran straight down to the water like a brick cliff, with the baby's apartment building doing the same on the other side. Lowell is like that with canals, one for every mill, dirty water running alongside the dirty streets or under them. Nothing like those romantic canals in the posters for Holland where flowers reflect in the water and there's a blue-eyed man behind every boat wheel. Ever since lunch, a spring rain had fallen. Then a wind came up and the sun came out and glittered off the slate roofs on the neighboring blocks of company housing. That day, Lowell looked good, the way used up brick towns can when the light's right. In the sparkle, the cockeyed look of the old buildings, how the shutters had peeled and loosened and fallen away, wasn't so noticeable. With everything shining, who cared if things didn't line up quite right anymore? The wet bricks and slate gleamed so hard under the blue sky you could ignore the sad look of fences missing pickets, how nothing had been fixed up for years. Weather had polished the WPA walkway. Beyond our cigarette smoke, the air looked as clean as if the smokestacks along the Merrimack River had held their breath. We'd been talking about men. I was as man crazy as a girl could be. I elbowed Katie O'Neill, the strapping redhead, and pointed at the maintenance man stacking wood pallets down on the side lot. You like those knotty arms? She wrinkled her nose and said, he's too short for my taste. You'll like him better when he bends over. <laughs> she said, nah, I don't care about his ass. I like men big. I got no use for the pretty little ones. She jutted her pale elbow onto the railing and sank her chin into her hand, a dreamy boozer leaning on a bar. I like to have to reach to get my arms around a man's neck. They call that dancing cheek to tie clip. Lucy <laughs> Madsen, the new girl with a southern accent, chimed in. I said, am I the only one who likes the shape of that fellow? He tossed the pallets into a pile as if they weighed nothing more than playing cards. Lucy scrunched up her face. She didn't have much going for her except her teeth, which were all hers and very white. She was a sad sack, but with a little makeup, I thought she could have passed for pretty. She said, he isn't my type at all. Katie O'Neill said to Lucy, I'd say you like your men in wheelchairs. Lucy's face went red as meat. Mr. O'Connor, the floor boss, had her pushing him in his wheelchair between the bays of us knitters as if he couldn't manage. Lucy was floor girl in knitting, which is where you started if you were like me and didn't have family at the mill to bring you in. She moved the trucks of bobbins along, hauled empty, empty trucks to pick up the done jobs, and swept up the lint and clippings which were everywhere like fur off some dark beast. Katie said, O'Connor can roll his own self around. He's got you thinking he's a vet or something and needs help. But Blood Sugar took his legs. I was a knitter in O'Connor's room. He tried that stunt on every new girl, and Lucy was the first to go for it without wanting special treatment in return. Wearing some cast-off brown sweater and lace-up shoes, she wheeled him and his ripe nose around the bays of that big room as if it was the least he could expect. She'd rest under the one working fan to cool herself. Her hair hung lopsided, bent up on one side, flat on the other. She slept on it wet, anyone could see. Someone said she was a nun who ran away. Lucy said, I don't like him, but I don't mind giving him a hand. Her words came out slow and round. She let a cigarette hang off her lower lip, trying to make her soft face look tough. She said, seems like if someone has no legs, no matter how he lost them, he could use a little help. Then she asked, who's got a light? I couldn't say as I knew any nuns who smoked. I pulled a pack of matches out of my apron pocket. That's when we saw the baby. At first, it was like someone had thrown a whole chicken out the window on the other side of the canal. The body dropping there just couldn't be a baby. The splash it made was strangely satisfying. Something had been finished, sewn up, and you could say, there, well, that's done with. The window screen, which had twirled and twisted in the air, landed with a splash a little farther along. Next to me, Sophie Robichaud flung her hands up over her eyes. The baby bobbed up in the brown water, flailing, face down. 
That open window just sat there in the sparkling wet brick wall, gaping like a dumb mouth while we waited for someone to come. Maria Sarzana, she was a mother, elbowed her way to the front of the platform and started to take off her apron. Maria's got a bum foot. I looked in the water, rubber pants floating, the pale baby in them, bottom up, and it had an air bubble in its tidies. Until I saw Maria getting ready to go after him, it didn't cross my mind that we could do anything. I couldn't swim, but I said, maybe I should go. Pulling at her shoe, Maria said, who are you fooling, Stella? You might break a nail. <laughs> Lucy'd already gotten over the railing by then. She hung on to it with one hand and ripped her shoes off with the other. She'd shed the sweater and her arms, too thin and white, poked out of her work apron. Her big eyes found mine and didn't let go as she handed me her shoes and stepped out into the air, all business. She held her nose. Her hair, which had been hanging like spaniel ears, flew up. Two stories she fell, feet first, her apron flapping up in her face. Who knew if it was deep enough? I held tight to her shoes. Katie O'Neill said, Gah, and leaned over, looking. Lucy came out of the splash, swimming as if she'd had lessons. My skin crawled with the idea of being in that water. She crossed the canal in six or seven strokes. We didn't cheer when she got to the baby because we couldn't see if it was all right. She flipped it over and swam on her side, dragging it with the current, kicking like mad to keep it up. All of packing and shipping rushed out and crowded farther along the edge of the canal. So when she climbed out, we couldn't see anything but the backs of a bunch of bent over folks in aprons. No one made a sound. You could have heard a mouse piss on cotton. Lucy was doing something in the midst of them on the ground. Since she jumped, each breath I'd breathed was one that the baby hadn't taken. My arms got to feeling icy. Goosebumps came up over them and went away again. I hung on to Lucy's shoes. Sophie Robichaud began to sniffle and pray in French. The man who'd had my attention straightening pallets sauntered out from the side lot to see what was going on. In the end, we'd all know his name and wish we didn't. But right then, standing by the others, he was just surprisingly short, not anything like what I'd thought. A murmur started out there by packing and shipping. Lucy Matson had saved that baby, she and his air-trapping rubber pants. Noe Hathaway, the head fixer, a little walnut of a man, came out of the crowd carrying the baby under his arm like a sports trophy. <laughs> the mill owner, Mr. William Burroughs, Jr., son of Hub Mill's founder, put his jacket around Lucy and led her inside by the arm. In the doorway behind us, Mr. O'Connor clapped his hands. That will be all, ladies. He let his voice slide on ladies, so you'd do anything to shut him up. Knitting is no work for anyone who needs variety. <coughs> I watched the mouth of my machine with its needles going up and down, around and around, casting the tube of one more black sock and thank that baby for giving us something different to think about. I'm going to um, say a little something about this baby. <laughs> um, he, he appears, as, as many of the characters do here, threading through. He has a little cameo appearance as an adult in one of the later stories um, where we find out that he's grown up to be a National Guard uh, Army notification officer. Um, so he, he did make it. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm going to read you a little bit from the last story, um, just to give you a, sort of an overview. <coughs> I can go water here. And then after I read, I'm hoping that people will ask me questions. And I'll try to answer them. <coughs> my, one of my husband's cousins is in the audience. And um, this character is based a little bit on one of her uncles. So. <laughs> um, although I, 
have to say I've made him French, which is really, really a bad <laughs> thing for an Italian family to have to have happen. <laughs> <laughs> Many years ago, Frenchie used to drive around Lowell on Sundays with his wife, Martine, just for something to do. After she got too sick, he drove alone. That was how he'd found the stone wall to work on. Frost, deep in the ground, had thrown the stories, the stones from their purpose and left them strewn at the border of meadow and woods. He didn't know who owned the land. On his days off, in all kinds of weather, he'd sweat to rebuild some long-dead farmer's ruined work. He would fit, fit his hands to the stones, feeling their rough curves, test their heft, eye their thickness, the contours, and snug them against each other. His focus made him forget the field behind and the woods in front of him until his back ached. Then he'd noticed the birds that had been singing all along and the occasional car passing on the road below. Working surrounded by the careless beauty of the earth's business helped him find the patience he needed to live the rest of his life. Three or four years into his wall rebuilding, a young woman carrying a handbag strode up from the road through the tall grass and meadow sweep. She wore polka dotted high heels, but by the time she reached him, a heel had broken off and she walked unevenly. He recognized her from the Phoenix luncheonette, the place he owned and where he worked the rest of the week. She put her broken heel on the wall and opened her handbag. I didn't know what you wanted me to do with this. She held a wad of bills out to him. The sleeves of her dress rippled in the breeze that lifted across the field. I didn't think I'd be seeing that again, he said. Did you think I was going to take off with it? I would have. She looked him up and down, taking in his sturdy build, the stone dust on his pants, and said, I doubt that. She held it out to him. He didn't take it. He would brought a thermos of strong coffee and poured her a cup. She dropped the roll of bills back into her handbag. Thanks. They said I would find you here on Sundays. She looked at his work. Is this a second job? She sipped her coffee. He said, I don't need that money. A gust of wind pinned her dress against her legs. She eyed him steadily. Is there something wrong with it? Same as any money. There's funny business behind every bill. That doesn't usually stop people from wanting it. She reached into her handbag. If it isn't yours, tell me who to take it to. It's burning a hole in my purse. It's yours. She bounced the wad of cash, testing its heft in her hand. Do you know how much is here? Her nails were lacquered, brilliant red. He'd made a split second decision and thrown the money her way because she looked like someone who wouldn't do anything stupid. Now he turned back to his work, heaved a big uneven stone onto the wall and shimmed it into place with a smaller one. She finished her coffee and fitted the heel to her shoe experimentally. There was something sad and dashing about her standing with her dress flapping like a flag at the edge of the woods, but he didn't know what made him say that he didn't need the money. Maybe he wanted to seem the sort of man who had plenty. He worked the counter of his luncheonette short order from 5.30 in the morning until 6 at night except Sundays and Christmas. At home, he fixed supper for his wife, who was nearly housebound. He ate, watching TV in the bedroom until she tired and fell asleep. The bills for her care piled up on the table in the hallway. After he had swiveled the big stone to fit better, he couldn't keep from turning to look at the woman. She sat on the grass behind him with her dress tucked under her legs, smoking a cigarette. Beyond her, the sunlight glinted off the mills, the bridges over the Merrimack and Concord rivers, and the dome of City Hall. Her hair was dark almost black and stylish. He watched her red nails lift a speck, maybe tobacco, from the end of her tongue. Her skin, to touch, might be the world's opposite of stone. I'm waiting to hear what strings are attached, she said. He shook his head and pointed the way she had come. She slid the bangles up her wrist, on her wrist up and down. I came all the way up here to return it. She took her other shoe off and stood stocking-footed in the grass. He didn't want to have to think. He wanted simply for her to understand the money was hers and to get out of his sight. 
She said, how about if we start over? She gave him a wry, off-center smile. Then we'll know that if you're going to do anything stupid, at least you've had time to think about it. She stuck the heel of her good shoe between two rocks in the wall and pried it off as if she were opening a bottle of beer. She dropped both heels into her bag, put her shoes on, and left him. He watched her go, unbelieving at first, and then fed up with himself. What did she think he was going to think about? Every workday, Frenchy left his house in the quiet of early morning, crossed Central Street, and let himself in the luncheonette's back door. <clears throat> He always used the same pull and turn to open it. He flipped on the lights, lifted a fresh apron from the drawer, and tied the strings comfortably low around his hips. He turned on the grill and washed his hands, took papers of bacon out of the walk-in, and started prepping the onions. Every day was a blur of orders and faces, most of them well known to him. At 5.45, he counted the day's take and walked home to his wife's suffering, his dread. What was there to consider, really? The antiseptic smell of his house, Martine's blood testing kit spilling out of its case on her bedside table, the mess in the kitchen that waited until he got to it, how he could hardly remember the flirty, unpredictable girl he'd married, her trim little body, her smart mouth, how she used to keep him off balance and treat. Love had brought him straight to the disappointment of a narrow life. He started after the young woman, but couldn't see where she'd gone. He'd let that money out of his hands a second time, and it felt as if he'd stolen it directly from his wife's well-being. And what for? For a sense of importance, to be someone who made grand gestures to a beautiful woman? He didn't even know her name. Any savvy he thought was his had been tossed into the rubbish the minute she found him working on the wall. During the next week, he asked around. By the next Sunday, when she climbed back up the hill, he knew her name was Stella Lewis, that she'd come from up north and gotten mixed up in some union boosting or busting, depending on how you, who you asked, at one of the mills. She had no family. That day as he worked on the wall, his mind didn't so much empty as it filled with the shapes of the stones in his hands. Rebuilding made sense to something inside him that craved the lifting, the fitting, the eventual tiredness. Each stone that fit brought the satisfaction of a solution. Fifty feet or more now stood mended. That, was, that wall was the place in his life he made progress. This time she wore flat shoes. She didn't look him in the eye. She didn't carry a handbag. She turned to the view as if she'd suddenly gone shy. She stared at her hands, at her nails, then tried putting them behind her back. She said, do you have a cigarette? His problem wasn't just that she was such a pleasure to look at. She put herself together with attention. She knew how to compensate for the discrepancies between how one is and how one looks. He handed her a cigarette. She let him light it for her. She held her mouth to the side to exhale the smoke. I saw the paper. He turned away from her. The little son had written up the charges against him and how there hadn't been enough evidence to substantiate the claims of the state cops. He said, you've decided something? It's your money. He turned to her, but you didn't bring it with you. She folded her arms. What would you say if I told you I'd put it in the bank? I'd say, he pursed his lips and shrugged, that, that would be the evidence. The story in the paper is true. He pressed his lips together. His arrest had embarrassed him deeply. It's not in the bank, she said, but it's safe. He patted the top of the wall by him. Come and sit. He was looking for something not to like about her. Let's see if this wall of mine is worth anything. At the time, he had no notion of how important the place would become to him. The view of Lowell wasn't half bad from there. The mile of mills took up most of the horizon. What would you do with eleven and some thousand dollars, he said. Her eyes lightened up. She might have been about to smile. I can see you in a fur coat. She laughed and dabbed at the perspiration on her forehead with the back of her hand. Not today. Her bracelets jingled. I'd invest, but not in that. Then what? She cocked her head at him. Who wants to know? I'm Frenchy. 
I know that, but so is every Tom, Dick, and Harry in Little Canada. <laughs> and the rest of them haven't been thinking about giving me thousands of dollars. My name is Robert Dura. Robert Dura. She looked at the sky. You want me to keep my mouth shut about what happened at the Phoenix. So you think it's a good idea to let me have the money, especially if I didn't ask for more. He said, it's more complicated than that. She had a tiny white scar on her chin shaped like a chevron. Everything is, she said. Neither of us wants to owe the other. What if we both put it to use? Split it? How about a partnership? He hadn't understood just what she had in mind, but in all the years Frenchie had been taking bets over the counter at the Phoenix, he'd never allowed anyone to find a way into his business. Disgusted with his own sloppiness, he eased himself off the wall and said, just keep the cash. So I'll stop there and um, take questions um, about anything that you want to ask me about. <laughs> It ha that, that question has a variety of answers. Um, one is um, that uh, I wasn't sure. I had a, the first story is probably as close to autobiographical as any of them get, although I've never worked in a mill. Um, I had a very, very close friend when I was young who disappeared from my life, which is what happens. Um, she didn't disappear from the earth, just from my life, inexplicably. And I, I wasn't sure, um, I knew I didn't want to, there's so many stories are set in college settings, or um, I don't know, I needed a place where women's lives really were pushed up against one another. And um, just about the time that I was trying to figure out where to set the story, I heard on, um, on the Blood and Guts News, um, Channel 56, <laughs> um, that uh, a baby in Lawrence had fallen out of a mill window. And uh, that a mill worker, this was in, this was in the, maybe in the 90s, um, a mill worker who had been taking a break opposite where the baby fell actually did jump into the canal and save the baby. So that story sort of lodged in my head. And, and then it, um, it sort of worked around to my getting very interested in, in uh, I love mill buildings. And where there are mills, there are stories. And so I started, there's a kind of a magnetism that, um, that mill towns have for me. And I also did marry into a, an Italian family, and their, their home base is Holyoke. So I've spent a <coughs> lot of time in Holyoke, um, getting to know not the French Canadians, but the Italians. <laughs> um, um, the, other, the other answer to that question is that Lowell is is in, in a way a, a blank slate for me, Mill City. And when there's a little bit of, of mystery or something not really not known, that, that leaves a lot of room for imagination. So I could, I could go to that city and, and fill in the blanks. Um, and when I did go to that city and started to, to learn about it, I discovered um, a book uh, <coughs> called The Last Generation, which was um, written by Mary Blewett, a, um, She's a professor emeritus at UMass Lowell. She did interviews with the last generation of mill workers um, just as the mills were dying out and learned their life stories and compiled them in this fascinating book. So I had a lot of characters to, to draw on from, from Mary Blewett's book. So it's a rich history there. Sarah. So was your intention to uh, string all these stories together, or did you write this first story and then all of a sudden you found new stories and your characters just kept putting themselves in all? It wasn't your, and they just yeah. took over. Yeah, it, it was very gradual, and I think I'd written about four of them before I realized <coughs> that the father in two of them was the same man. And then everything just it was like a little jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really, really fun to put together. Um, and in some places difficult. But no, I, it, it, I didn't conceive of it as a, as a big mm -hmm. picture. It was feeling my way in the dark. Just writing stories. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's, um, Frenchie has a lot of my father-in-law in him. Oh. Your Uncle Joe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Although, although I have to say, for the record here, everybody, he never had an affair with anyone like Stella Lewis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
some, I think you've read a couple, one or two of them so you are in here. This has been a work over how many years? Um, that's really a hard question to answer. I mean, the real, the really honest question would be my age, <laughs> but um, I, <laughs> I, I think um, probably the the first the, the story that I first read you was probably the first one um, that I started working on, and that was probably ten ten years ago. Although in its first its first and maybe even its second attempts, it it, uh, it withered, and I had to start again. So it's hard it's hard to say. But I would say ten years, yeah, about, which is not my age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, I was just wondering whether you were involved with a writers group uh, at certain phases uh, throughout this venture. This, this venture, mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, and how was that helpful or not to you? Um, the most, the most transformative experience that I had was to stop trying to write stories on my own and to go get an MFA at the Warren Wilson Program for Writers, um, and uh, that knowledge just incredible, just took all this information and just <laughs> jammed it into my head and and changed me as a writer. Um, writing groups have helped. Mm -hmm. um, also, it's it, writing is you know you, everyone talks about it being a completely s solitary um, pursuit, but but really you you need reality checks all the way along because you're making stuff up and you have to find out if it's if you have made it believable or not. Mm -hmm. So you need you need a trusted little cadre of of other writers. I think mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure there are lots of people who can do it on their own, but I'm not. Lucy. Did you have one editor you worked with through the whole project, or at the end, was there a good editor? I had, um, yes, I had a really extraordinary experience um, because this was published by Southern Methodist, Methodist University Press. Um, it meant that I, because university presses really take their time with books. And they have real editors who it's, it's not it's not like you work with your agent and then you put a manuscript in and the publisher publishes what you've handed them. Um, Catherine Lang is her name, and she and I had a long and very um, very close email relationship for about six months. I wasn't rewriting any big chunks of this book. We were doing what she called lapidary work, <laughs> tipping little details in that needed to be there for continuity and things like that. And it was really a fascinating, wonderful experience to, to have that kind of guidance from someone who's, who's shepherded many, many books from that stage into, into print. Um, so anyone who's hesitating to, to send their manuscripts to university presses, I highly recommend it as a really positive experience. You know, I've thought a couple of times of things that I could have done more. <laughs> that maybe someone needs to come back again. There's one character in here named June who has, uh, she has one story and she appears peripherally in others, but I think she might not be done saying everything she has to say. Um, but I th maybe she'll be in another book. But I, I, no, I didn't feel, I, I'm someone, I don't, I don't have a lot, I'm not a real chatty person, so. I think probably coming to the end is easier for me than <laughs> 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 yeah. did, did you ever struggle with some of the tragedies that you created, created. for us readers? <laughs> 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 I mean, do you ever think about how we feel yeah. when we're reading these things? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Have you ever changed your mind? Uh, have I ever rescued anybody? <laughs> um, well, you did rescue the baby, but yes. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the reasons I think that I write is to work through the tough stuff, and um, so I haven't thought about rescuing my readers so much. Um, also, one of the things that I learned in graduate school was that you, if you protect your characters, not very much happens if you keep them safe all the time. Mm -hmm. So there's a choice between action and bad things happening or inaction and everything being a little calmer. Mm -hmm. um, 
So uh, you have my sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I really, really appreciate it.